Evil and corrupt cops are everywhere, but what happens when they actually get caught? I can't believe what you're telling me. Here are five shocking examples of when evil cops realize they're going to prison. Starting out with Detective Michael Neely, who was found in a hotel room sitting on top of his police chief's dead body. Mike and his chief, Johnny Miller, were away for a conference, and one night the two went out looking for a couple of drinks. But after a long night of drinking, Mike woke up in police custody and was immediately taken to the very same room he'd been interrogating suspects in for the last 10 years. But this time, it wasn't him asking the questions. So tell me, Mike, you guys um, flew out of Tulsa? Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, okay. And to Pensacola? Yeah. Was it a direct flight? No. Uh, where, where'd you guys stop? Houston. Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there? Got to the hotel and sit. Mike is keeping all his answers short, which is a good idea in this situation. But it's up for debate whether it's because he knows it's the best move or just because he's still extremely hungover. Any problems uh, or anything going on in the crowd? Just normal dinner or what? It's normal. Any drinks there or just dining with a couple beers? And... Was it a early dinner, late dinner or what? It's pretty early. It was a. Uh... I don't think it was dark yet. Uh, tell me once what, what you guys did once you got back to the hotel. About it, just watch football game. That was a Dallas game, starting. Mike said the night consisted of a football game and a couple beers, but in reality, things went much further than that. Tests reveal that both men's blood alcohol levels were around or above 0.3. To put that in perspective, a level of 0.4 is widely considered to be a fatal dose, and 0.3 will likely result in alcohol poisoning, a condition that can lead to death and loss of consciousness. Either way, both men will have been completely out of control of their own emotions and actions, likely leading to the horrifying events that occurred that night. Do you remember... Um Hotel staff or hotel employee coming up and telling you guys to keep it down? I don't. I don't remember that. So what is the last thing you remember as far as that evening until the football game? I, I mean, I, I know you're asking me questions, but can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Okay, homicide, who, 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 who is dead? Dead. Dead? Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I, I probably don't have any, anything else to say then. Uh, I've got nothing, nothing to say to you. Mike was initially told he was brought in for a homicide investigation, but only now told that it's his police chief, Miller, who died. Remember, Mike was so drunk last night that he almost certainly doesn't remember a thing. So knowing how bad his current position is, he decides to invoke his right to silence, telling the cops that he's got nothing else to say. But these are trained detectives, and they're about to put all their years of experience to work. Michael, you've been charged with second degree murder. Okay. okay. I, I had no idea what I was being charged with. Yeah, you're being charged with second degree murder, and you're fixing to be booked in the Scamby County Jail with no bond. And we've already notified your uh, your wife. Okay. Uh, and um, the victim. Yes. I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. You have any questions for us? I mean, I've, yeah, I've got a, a thousand of them, but I mean, it really doesn't make it. Well, I mean, sure it does. I mean, if you want to talk, we'll sit here and listen to you talk. I mean, we'd love to know what the heck happened. I, um, I, but I mean, that's that's up to you. I mean, we'll answer your questions, you know, in return. So I, I would love to know what happened to, uh, you know. Well, I mean, do you want to continue to talk to us? If you do, then I mean, we'll tell you what happened. I mean, I, I I would love I I would like to I would like to know what happened, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm telling you I don't uh, I don't have any memory of of any of this shit, and I I'm, I'm shocked. Do you want us to? You want to continue talking to us? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll continue to talk. I'd, I'd like to know what happened. The detectives used two techniques here to persuade Mike into staying with them. First, they're reminded of the position he's in, almost threatening him with the punishments he's immediately facing. Then they ask if he has any questions for them. Obviously, given that they know Mike has no recollection of the previous night's events, he'll be scrambling to figure out what happened and if there's any way out of it for him. Imagine you woke up in a jail cell being told you're going to prison for killing your boss while blackout drunk. You do everything you could to piece together that night's events. Mike is now starting to realize that's his only option. Watch how his demeanor changes as he starts to almost join in his own investigation. I'm, I'm trying to get you 
to figure out what's the last thing you remember. Mm -hmm. And if you, the last thing you remember was watching football, uh, do you remember drinking? Yep. Okay. Were you drinking the vodka? Yeah, I drank some vodka. Okay. So, mm -hmm. well, the first call came a little bit after six, I believe. One of the guys that uh, was in the room next to you didn't say you guys were arguing, just being loud, just laughing, yelling, probably. So the next noise complaint came out about nine minutes till 10. This time you can't get anybody to come to the door. All he hears, he's knocking. He hears just grumbling, grunting, uses his car to get in, is on the ground between the bed and the wall. You are sitting on his chest. His face is beaten. The statement that was given by the second noise complaint could hear a male saying, Mike, stop, Mike, stop. And then it just went quiet. Mike reiterates that he's got absolutely no memory of this and had no animosity towards Miller at any point. However, he also doesn't show remorse at any point. He just sits there confused and quite obviously only concerned for himself, repeating that he just can't believe what happened. The officers detail a little more about Miller's body and try desperately to get Mike to remember anything at all about the events, but he just sits there in complete disbelief. <laughs> I mean, you you can't think of anything that that would have triggered you to to jump on nothing. I mean, it's nothing. It's uh, I, it's, uh what do you, what? anything else? You got any questions for us, Mike? Before we get you across the street? No, I guess I'm getting booked into jail, and uh, yep, we're gonna uh, get you booked into jail and put in uh, special housing over there so that you're not back there with the uh, heads and stuff. Right. And uh, protective custody. You're not. Uh, you're not wanting to harm yourself or anything, are you? No. Michael Neely was indeed booked into jail and subsequently sentenced to life in prison on account of second-degree murder. But Michael took all this news surprisingly well. He just sat there and accepted his life was basically over, in complete contrast to the corrupt tactics of this police captain. Captain James French was caught drinking and driving and followed home by an officer. What followed was one of the most brazen examples of police corruption ever caught on camera. Stay in your vehicle. Get back in your car. I'm drunk? No, I'm the captain. Huh? A what? Captain. A what? The big, don't reach in your pocket. Get back in your car. I have a seat. I, I will. I'm not. You been drinking tonight? I just got a ride. You been drinking tonight, sir? I'm a captain on the police department. What police department? Oklahoma City. What division? Investigations. How much we had to drink tonight, sir? Please. Huh? Turn the camera off. I'm not turning my camera off. Okay. This guy isn't just drunk. He's absolutely hammered, even to the point where he thinks the camera can't hear him whispering. But despite the captain's pleas, the officer refuses to turn off his camera and continues with the investigation. Go ahead and step out of the vehicle. You gotta be kidding me. How much we drink tonight, sir? I was at a poker game. Uh-huh. Because you were swerving all over me when you turn on or you didn't use your signal. I'm sorry. How much you drink at your poker game? Not much. Not much? Mm -hmm. How much is not much? I don't know. Beer? Liquor? Yeah. How Beer. many beers? Three or four. Three or four? How long ago was that? It's been going on a while. How long ago did you drink your last beer, sir? What time is it now? It's 0140. Midnight. You think you should drive it? No, but I came from four blocks. And your mom your mom lives here. I live here. You live here? Yes. Come over to the rear of your vehicle. Okay. 
You got any weapons or anything on you? I do not, sir. Those must have been a strong few beers, as not only was he stumbling over his words, but apparently also swerving across both lanes on his way home. The captain is then searched and told to stand in the open where he's tested on his balance and sobriety. Hands down by your side, please. Look straight ahead. You see the tip of my pen, sir? I do. I want you to follow the tip of my pen without moving your head, okay? Come over here where it's a little bit more level. I'm going to demonstrate for you first. While I'm demonstrating, I want you to stand with your feet together, hands down by your side, just like this. All right, sir. What's your name? Matt French. Matt French. Mr. French, stand just like that for me. When I tell you to begin, okay, I'm just going to demonstrate for you first. I want you to pick a foot of your choosing. It doesn't matter if it's your left or your right foot. I'm from here. And I want you to lift it approximately six inches off the ground. And while you look at your toe, I want you to count by 1,000s, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, so on and so forth until I tell you to stop. At any point in time, you lose your balance or your foot touches the ground. Just go ahead and pick your foot back up and continue to count, okay? Do you understand these instructions I've explained to you, I Mr. Did. French? You may begin. 1,000. Sir, can, can you turn that off? I cannot, sir. Please. I know you're aware of our body cam policy. You know I cannot turn I, off this body I cam. I do, but I'd like to talk to you. I can can't do that, sir. Please. Are you going to do the test or not? Will you please talk to me? I'll talk you, to you once we're done. You can turn it off. You can turn it on. I can turn it off once I'm done with my investigation, sir. Okay. I'm a captain on the police department. I understand that, sir. I get and I that. am a sergeant on this police officer, and I I've taken not, an oath to uphold the law. I, I don't not, show favoritism to anyone, regardless. I don't I, care if you're a gangbanger or the president of the United States. Sir, I'm not asking you for that. If I was to treat you differently than I was to treat like some South Side loco or some pedo, how's that look on me? Okay, I'm not asking you for that. Because I wouldn't do that for any of them. Even as the captain begs him to turn his camera off and just talk, the officer stands his ground and states that he has to treat everyone the same or his job and livelihood could be at risk. He's showing a fantastic amount of integrity that unfortunately we don't get to see too often, likely due to people like this trying to pull rank. They then continue with the third and final test, involving simply walking heel to toe for 10 steps. All right, anytime you're ready, you may begin. One, two, three. Go ahead and turn around for me and put your hands behind your back. Are you going to arrest me, sir? Yes, I am. Can I talk to you? Go ahead and put your hands behind your back, sir. Now that the investigation is concluded and the perp is placed under arrest, the officer turns off his camera and returns the captain to the police department. Not only was he suspended from his position as Oklahoma police captain, but he was also hit with the regular punishments for DUI, likely amounting to a small fine and a few months in jail, a punishment that Stephanie Lazarus makes look like absolutely nothing. After decades of investigations, DNA evidence revealed that Stephanie was very likely the culprit of a murder committed in 1986. Six. Because of the high stakes nature of the case, the detectives made sure to meticulously plan this interrogation. Stephanie was a really successful detective herself, and she had recently received recommendations for her good work on a theft case. So the detectives used this and brought her in under the guise that they needed help with a case. I don't want to talk about this in the squad room because I, I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's always wondering what everybody else is doing. Okay. An interrogation room is a strange place for such a conversation to take place, so to put her mind at ease, detectives told her this was the place they'd least be likely to be overheard, as the case details were strictly confidential. Sherry Rasmussen's body had been found at her home after being shot three times. At the time, police suspected the murder was a result of a burglary gone wrong, but the case went cold when they couldn't identify the suspect. However, 23 years later, when revisiting the case, detectives found evidence that led them towards Stephanie, a girl who had been trapped in a love triangle with Sherry and her husband, John Rutten. So the detectives decided to bring up John's name to see how she'd react. 
Are you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. I yeah. Mean, I mean, what's this all about? It's a case we're working on. It involves John, and in there, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh yeah, I mean, we good friends. Um, lived in the dorms for. I lived in the dorms for two years. Was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys? Yeah, I mean, we dated. Uh, uh huh. You know, um, I mean. Is, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Both the detectives and Stephanie have tried to seem as friendly and relaxed as possible around each other, but Stephanie is obviously starting to get very anxious at this point. Even though the detectives gave a somewhat believable excuse, she is now in an interrogation room faced by two detectives being questioned about a girl she supposedly murdered 20 years earlier. Her breathing has become faster, and her language is defensive, and her movements have become more erratic. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay? So, you know, if you're, if you're doing this as an interrogation, you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with, you know, now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. Because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Stephanie chooses to provide DNA evidence, hoping her willingness to help out would ultimately prove her innocence. But, unfortunately for her, just five minutes later, the detectives decide they've heard enough and put her in cuffs. Months later, after a long and arduous trial, a decision was made by the jury. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stephanie Eileen Lazarus, guilty of the crime of murder of Sherry Rasmussen. We further find the murder was of the first degree. Stephanie was sentenced to 27 years in prison after being hit with a single felony charge of first degree murder. But to this next cop, Jalen Fleer, a single felony charge looks like child's play. Can I ask this? This is something I might, I should have lawyers on. In April 2020, San Diego police received tips that a man had been engaging in with a local child. Two months of investigation led directly to Jalen and a mountain of questions that desperately needed answering. So I know that I have a lot to delve into, but I, I really want to get to know you first, if you don't yeah, mind. Definitely. Okay. So I'm gonna lean back and get comfortable. Um, just because, are you comfortable? Do you want yeah, to take off I'm your duty belt? No, I'm good. I'm okay. Good. Can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, so I will ask what this is about. Yeah, so we're looking into some allegations that were made. We're kind of, it, it started with a Crime Stopper report, so we're just kind of okay. going from there. Um, uh, we did receive um, a picture um, that, um, you know, when we looked into it, it looks similar to you. So I don't know yeah. if you can take a look at the picture and just tell me if you've seen this picture before. <laughs> Oh, I have like 15 million things here. Okay. As soon as the allegations are brought up, Jalen becomes visibly stressed. He leans forward tentatively in his chair, clasps his hands together softly, and clenches his jaw. It's obvious he's worried about whatever he's about to be shown. The detectives have made it clear that he is not currently being detained and is free to leave at any time. However, she is making a noticeable effort to make him feel relaxed, using a bubbly and friendly persona to put him at ease. So this picture right here? Yeah, that's definitely me with the gross one. Okay, so um, this picture right here, how old were you when it was taken? Uh, I don't know, 20? 20? Okay, cool. That makes it very easy. Um, so, as far as like um, the picture, so um, this photo came up in connection with some allegations um, about you communicating with a younger female on Snapchat. Okay. Can I ask, is this something I might, I should have lawyers on? Jalen is starting to seem more and more stressed. He begins to sway in his chair more and becomes more closed off with his answers. But the pressure he's feeling now is nothing compared to what the detective is about to lay on him. Um, so, you know, this, like I said, this photo was um, sent to this person, so they were in possession of it, and we can't find any connection or reason why this photo would end up with this particular person if it wasn't shared by someone you may know or yourself. I agree, yeah. I, my wife would have done it, so I don't know why she would share that. So. Well, along with the photo came some additional information about your personal life. Okay. Um, and based on some of the information you shared with me today, it seems to add up. Okay. 
The account that shared the photo and the information was called J178211, a seemingly random selection of numbers, until you realize that 17 was his college baseball jersey number, 82 was his high school jersey number, and 2011 was the year he graduated in. If this account was operated by a so-called enemy of J, they'd sure done their research. J, I'll be very honest, I just, I want to know the truth. Yeah, no, I never even heard of that account. Okay. Have you ever shared any images of your p with anyone? Yeah. Okay. And how many times would you say you've done that? A lot. Did you ever share any videos of you having p with anyone? With anyone? No. I've always had personal videos of me in my life. That was it. And my ex actually had one, but... Jalen then rightly decides that he's already answered enough of the detective's questions and asks him for a lawyer. However, unfortunately for him, he's quickly handed a search warrant, allowing the police to seize DNA, his phone, and his car. Police used this to gather a mountain of evidence against Jalen and, just a few weeks later, turned himself in. Jalen was charged with 20 felonies, including engaging in lewd acts with children under the age of 14 pandering children under 16, and engaging in <laughs> the child under the age of 16. A few months later, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison, a fraction of the amount Grant Hardin received after a murder investigation led to the shocking discovery of a crime committed over a decade earlier. Grant has been apprehended on suspicion of murder, but the secret he was hiding would end up making him so desperate, he would try everything he possibly could to escape. On the 23rd of February, James Appleton had pulled into a parking lot on Ganridge Road to take a phone call with his brother-in-law. Suddenly, a loud banging sound was heard over the phone, and the line went dead. A passerby had spotted a white Chevrolet Malibu parked behind James's car that immediately sped away after the loud noise. When the passerby went to check on James, he was lying dead at the wheel with a gunshot wound to the head. Gateway, Arkansas is a small town of 400 people, so the owner of the Chevy was quickly determined to be Grant Hardin, a 50-year-old police officer who had lived in this town his whole life. Later that night, Grant's vehicle was stopped at a police roadblock after taking his family out for dinner, and he was quickly brought in for questioning. But unfortunately for everyone involved, Grant's experience in law enforcement would prove to make this interrogation one of the most excruciating and difficult that Arkansas police had ever had to deal with. I'm Detective Chamberlain. I know we have met James Chamberlain. Okay. Uh, I, did you used to be a police officer yeah. somewhere? Or, I, I recognized you, but I wasn't 100% sure where I knew you from. But somebody said that you used to be a police officer in Gateway or yeah. something like that. Okay. The interrogation begins casually as Detective Chamberlain opens with questions about Grant's career. As they're both police officers, he assumes he can strike an immediate middle ground with him, building trust between them and hoping hopefully getting him to relax so he'd give up information easier. A strategy that he'd soon find out had the opposite effect. Grant is then read his rights, but decides this is where he's going to start making it difficult for the detectives. Here's the thing, I want to talk to you about what, what you've done today, okay? Can you just take me through when you woke up this morning to when you got stopped by the police out there in, what's the name of that road that you're on? I'm sorry, I'm going to drop again, Rich. I'm not going to say anything after I've been read those rights yet. Okay. Well, I don't know what's going on. I am kind of sickly <laughs> to, uh, to what I'm here for and things. Up until this point, Grant hasn't been told what he's been brought in for, and states that he's feeling sickly, given the circumstances he's been put into. Given his disturbing body language, he may also be feeling exposed and somewhat inferior due to being the suspect of a case instead of the detective for the first time in his life. So you don't want to explain what you've done today? Did you? Um, is there a reason behind that? What well, was the first thing said? I had the right to remain silent. Okay. So you're telling me that you don't want to talk to me right now? Okay, cool. Hang tight right here for just a few minutes, okay? As is normal in a case like this, the detectives leave the room for a few minutes to talk about how they're going to handle the interview. And not only does it give them time to formulate their approach, but it also gives the suspects time alone to worry about what could be going on and form anxiety regarding their situation. At the same time, though, it may also give the suspect a moment to collect their thoughts and generate their own story and approach to the interview, putting the detectives on the back foot instead. Detective Cordero. I think we've met once before. Probably so. Yeah, yeah. 
okay, so I, I, I don't know if I scared you at the beginning or, or what, but that's why I was trying to, and I can't, you see, you see the position that I'm in, I can't tell you why you're here, but at the same time, I, I, I need to rule you out into something. Does that, does that make sense? When the detectives re-enter the room, they try an obviously different approach, this time attempting to set Grant at ease, stating that they just need to clear him from any wrongdoing, and then he's free to go on his way. Many people would, at least subconsciously, be inclined to open up a little more in an attempt to get out of there as soon as possible. But Grant has other ideas. Would you be willing to talk to me about your day knowing that I need to rule you out of something? Or like, I, I, I'm just, if you didn't do anything wrong today, you have nothing to worry about. Yes, I, I would have liked to, but before yeah. the rights were read. So okay. not knowing what's going on. Yeah, and you understand as a detective, we, have, we read those rights to everybody who comes in here. It's not just you. It, it happens to everybody that walks through this room and talks to us. As a former police officer, Grant is fully aware of all of this. He also knows that staying silent is a right and should not be used against him to imply guilt. So he continues to refuse to answer any questions to try and shake the cops off. I guess my question is this. Knowing what I just told you, I guess if it was me and I was, you know, if I was in your position, I'd be like, hey, James, I did this, I was at, or Grant, I did this, I was at, you know, here, 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 and here, and I would just be done with it. But at this point, like, I can't clear you from this because you could still be, potentially be a suspect. I don't know if I'm not explaining it right or, or what yeah, was going on here. It fine. I just okay. to, once, the, once the rights have been read, I have to, uh, it says I have the right to be silent. Yes. Okay. Just tell me this. I know you're a police officer before, right? You're you're a police officer in in Gateway. It's an easy yes or no. I, I'm being silent. Well, I can see that. We can do this all night. I mean, it doesn't bother me. You're going to continue to be a suspect until I find out otherwise. Okay. Unfortunately for the detectives, Grant is exercising perfect form within this interrogation. Refusing to talk greatly hinders the investigation as a whole and completely prevents the detectives from making progress, all while being completely legal. This is why Detective Chamberlain is starting to appear visibly annoyed and decides to take a break from the interrogation, as letting emotions take control in an investigation like this can be extremely dangerous for the detectives. But once again, this time alone can also give the suspects the chance to come up with a plan. Hello, I need to go. You need to go where? Home or get ready for work in a little bit. Okay, we'll just have a seat and I'll get, I'll get it for you. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. No, they're also calling you. Want to talk to me again? What's going on? I'm just ready to go. Okay. And I'm not I'm not ready for you to go yet, so you're not gonna be able to go. I've got other things that I'm doing right now, so well, I I just wanna I was gonna go. Oh no, you're I'm not, not gonna go. Tell you that. Okay, yeah, no, you're not gonna but go. But I'm waiting. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Oddly enough, in many other investigations like this, now is around the time where an officer may attempt to come to a decision regarding the suspect. The interview is obviously at a complete standstill and no progress is being made in any direction. The standard protocol would be to either gather the information needed to charge the suspect for a crime or release them based on a lack of evidence. But whether the detective thinks he can extract more information or if it was an ego-based decision, Grant is told to stay and continue the interrogation. The police then try to take some time to piece together more of the story, talking to witnesses to try and place Grant at the scene of the crime. Despite his silence being perfectly legal and acceptable, it greatly increases the detective's suspicion towards him. Suspicion that's only heightened when Grant's wife says that his only alibi was that she thought he was spreading grass seeds at the time of James's death. All signs point towards Grant, and Detective Chamberlain goes back in for round three. Uh, Detective Cordero is talking to your wife right now. I talked to her a little bit. So I've kind of got a timeline of where you were and where you weren't today. Um, we all know what happened, okay? I'm not trying to get you in any trouble. I'm not trying to get her in any trouble. You've got a little daughter, 16, who needs her parents, okay? I don't know if you've had a problem with this guy for a while 
or and this was an accident or you maliciously chasing down or, or what happened but if I don't get your side of the story I won't ever know we're writing a book you got chapter one you got chapter two and chapter three chapter one is what happened today what started out today how your day started chapter two is what led up to the incident and chapter three is you telling me about what happened to lead you up to that? I know you went to eat, uh, you know, out tonight. I know what you said at dinner. I know that you went to Lowe's afterwards. I know, I know everything, but I don't know what caused the incident. And if I don't know that, I've got to assume the worst. I'll let you think about it. I'm, I'll give you one more chance here in a few minutes, and I'm like, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not telling you that. Well, what happened? I know you know. We have witnesses that put you there. They physically ID'd you. The two cars that drove by. Look, man, I'm not... I, I just want to know why it happened. I, I'm going to sleep good tonight regardless. I don't think you will. At the time of the murder, when the two cars were parked up beside each other, the man in the white Chevrolet waved to the passerby past before the gun was fired. As they passed, they were able to get a good look at the driver. And unfortunately for Grant, it was Andrew Tillman, another resident of the small town who had known him since he was a child, and was hence able to undoubtedly place him at the scene of the crime as the gun went off. Both Grant and Chamberlain know without a doubt what happened to James, but Grant also knows that his only chance of escaping is to continue to remain silent and pray that they can't gather the evidence they need. The detectives are now forced to try almost anything they can think of to get movement out of Grant, starting with allowing him to see his wife and daughter in hopes that it will invoke some sort of emotional reaction within him and get him to talk. Your wife's about to leave. She wanted to give you a hug before she left. Are you good with that? Right. Okay. All right, I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Unfortunately, even this doesn't work. So instead, Detective Cordiero decides to return alone with a more calm and sympathetic demeanor in a second attempt to build trust with Grant. Often, male suspects are more likely to build a subconscious connection with female detectives due to them often thinking that they're less threatening and more understanding. Realistically, this is the last option the detectives have. All right, get ready to Thing about laying down up on that desk, but it looks awful hard. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be any more comfortable up there than you what you are now. Can you help me understand how I got to this point? I don't know. I don't know. Man, I remember being on patrol and running into you one night. Help me out on a call. Back me up. Oh. Uh, it was way back in, uh, I guess almost three years now. Well, two, two, yeah, something like so. that. Yeah, something like that. You guys are always good to help us, help, help me too. Yeah, absolutely. Brad, you were always right there, man. Cordiero opens up with an anecdote about how Grant apparently backed her up on a case three years ago. Even though he doesn't necessarily remember it, this will give him the idea that Cordiero will be even more sympathetic and helpful towards him as he's done her a favor in the past. It also allows them to continue reminiscing about their time on the force and the people they've worked with, further strengthening the subconscious bond Grant will be creating. I just don't understand how we got to this point. Yeah, me neither. You're on the top. Oh, tell I'm me. just ready to go to bed. I don't blame you. Me too. <laughs> me too. And if we could do that, you just talk to me. <laughs> well, I just have to. Since you read those rights, I have to stay. I have to do the right. Well, what? The right. What's the difference? The you know the difference. Regardless of something happened or not, and if it did, if it was an accident, well, tell me. Like, let me help, help me help you. Like, I want to know what I can do or what happened today to well, be able to explain it later. I, I don't know what happened today. I just need to... You know, people are going to have questions. Mm -hmm. Your family. Well, I have questions. Well, exactly. So... So why can't we figure this out together? Cordero is making a conscious effort to use inclusive language, such as, we will figure this out together. This and her open and expressive body language are both techniques she's using to make Grant feel more relaxed, and as though he's part of the solution, not the problem. She's also making every effort to be nice to Grant, in hopes that maybe he'll finally open up to her, or at least give her a way in. We can start from the very beginning. 
I mean, I know you probably slept in because you work nights. I work nights. Trust me, I work nights for almost four years. I understand how yeah. that sleep schedule is. Yeah, I was sleep so. So. I missed it. Did you sleep in today? Yeah. I <laughs> bet you did. You could have got to work tonight, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What time did you get up? Noonish. Around noon. That's usually what time I got up to. Did you watch anything good on TV? Usually that's what I do. I'd eat and watch TV. I woke myself up a little bit. <laughs> anything good? Same old stuff. Oh, yeah? On TV. You watch the same episodes? Or, like, do you have a specific TV show you would wake up and watch? Well, we watched, uh, I mean, my wife always has it on, uh, I can't remember what channel it's called, right now, TV Land. Oh, okay. I haven't really watched any of that. I don't even, I couldn't even tell you what it was about. Is your wife like that? Oh, yeah, I think she'd rather watch other stuff. But that's <laughs> all you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It might not be about the case, but finally, Grant is talking, and Cordero has found her way in. If she can keep the flow of this conversation up, she might be slowly able to extract information from him even without him knowing. Talking about specifics such as TV shows and sleep schedules, even that could lead to catching him in a lie, and placing him in certain places at certain times. But most importantly, she's building a connection with him and continuing to let him talk, which increases the chance that he either slips up or decides to make it easier on the detectives and answer a question. But predictably, as soon as Cordero started asking him to talk about the case again, he shut down once more, refusing to answer any more questions and staying silent. I think you have a lot to live for. Beautiful family, who I've had the privilege of talking to. The way I look at it, is you're a man. Men face their mistakes and they own up to them. Mm -hmm. And they figure out what happened and figure out how to solve it and move on. Like I said, I'm, I'm honestly here to help you. I want you to understand that. I wouldn't spend my time in here with you if I didn't. And that something happened today that needs to be explained. Did you make a mistake today? Even after reminding him of his family, Grant doesn't move an inch, again realizing that his only chance of being let off is to not speak and hope they don't find anything. I like you, I like this fella that was a detective here, and I know they all don't care about any of that and stuff, and I just don't know how to, how to, uh, when I have had this happen before, uh, mm -hmm. being brought in and interrogated for something, so I don't. I don't care, but I just don't know how to, how to, I think, how to be silent to sit over here looking like a jerk. No, you're not. That, honestly, you were far from that. You're very polite. <laughs> don't you know why you're here? I appreciate you guys, and I'm just going to kind of get a lawyer. Yeah, it's up to you. But you can obviously it. something's going on, and I need one. I just want to hear your side of it. I want to get a lawyer. After hours of almost pointless back and forth, Grant finally asks for a lawyer, meaning the detectives can no longer question him, and concludes the interrogation. But this is far from where the story ends. Between this interrogation and the final court hearing, Grant and his lawyer both realized that there was simply no way he was going to be released scot-free. Not only was there a man at the scene of the crime who all but saw him pull the trigger, people were also starting to realize that he'd actually either been fired or resigned from three different police force jobs before becoming the chief of police in his hometown. So, on October 16th, 2017, he pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder, but refused to reveal his motive, leaving each member of James Appleton's family without closure to this day. However, as Grant was being prosecuted, a shocking revelation was made that turned him, a murderer, into a senseless monster of a human being. As his DNA was being taken, they realized it was already in the system, under an unknown name for a crime committed almost 20 years ago. In November of 1997, a teacher at Frank Tillery Elementary School went to the teacher's lounge bathroom only to be met by a man brandishing a gun that forced her into a stall. The man then ripped her and fled, taking care not to touch anything or leave evidence behind, except for the 
anything left on her clothes. Local police did everything they could to identify the perp, but after 20 months of effort, the investigation went cold until 20 years later, when Grant Hardin's DNA was found to be a perfect match. And because Rogers police had obtained a John Doe warrant back in 2003, allowing them to arrest an unknown suspect and bypass the statute of limitations, he was hit with the 14-year sentence for his on top of the 21 years for the murder of James Appleton. And as such, Grant Hardin was sentenced to 35 years in prison, meaning that he'll likely live out the rest of his life behind bars.